Hello, hello, and welcome once again to a Beatles talk show podcast, a bi-weekly show that we call Things We Said Today. This is the program where we talk about anything and everything that has to do with the Beatles, about the years together, the solo years, any of their music, what's going on in the news, whatever we feel like in the moment. I'm Ken Michaels. I'm one of the three regular co-hosts of this show, and I hope that you know me for my other two Beatles programs, a syndicated radio show on the Beatles called Every Little Thing, also another talk show podcast, which is a live video podcast called Talk More Talk on the Solo Beatles, and I'm being joined by one of my regular co-hosts, and that is someone who just, by the way, celebrated... <laughs> Celebrated his 35th anniversary on the air in New York City on Radio's WFUV. He's pretty much their authority on the Beatles there. He's done wonderful interviews, done work on the Beatles there, Beatles specials, and that's our own Darren DeVivo. Hello, thank you, Ken, and hello, everyone, and thanks for the anniversary wishes. Believe me, I'm going to be milking that on this show. All right. All right. <laughs> and, and, and all of our future programs. <laughs> and also, we should say that our other regular co-host, Alan Cozen, couldn't make it for, for the show. He had a prior engagement, so he will be joining us for our next program. But we do happen to have a special guest who will be joining us in just a few moments here on the show. But first, as we usually do, we're going to get to the latest news. We have a few items to bring up. Ringo Starr has added two more dates in the New York area with his all-star band for their 30th anniversary tour. Darren doesn't realize this, but I stole this from his Facebook post. <laughs> um, following their date in Bethel, New York on August 16th, Ringo will play the Long Island Community Hospital Amphitheater, formerly known as the Penny Saver Amphitheater, at Bald Hill in Farmingville. And on August the 18th, he'll be at the rooftop at Pier 17 in New York City in South Street Seaport, in the South Street Seaport District. Tickets for this show went on sale last Friday. Also, great news to hear that the documentary on the making of John Lennon's album, Imagine, called John and Yoko, Above Us Only Sky, which recently aired on BBC television when the new remastered archival box set for Imagine came out in October, well, that documentary will be shown in the U.S. on the A&E channel as part of their biography, Strand. And that's going to be on March the 9th at 9 p.m., and that's Eastern Standard Time. This documentary puts emphasis on the creative collaboration between John and Yoko. It also includes interviews with Yoko, Julian Lennon, photographer David Bailey, gallerist John Dunbar, who introduced the couple, the Lennon's personal assistant, Dan Richter, and studio designer Eddie Veal. And the special is produced by Eagle Rock Films in association with the A&E Network. I'm looking forward to that, especially to compare it to what Give Me Some Truth was, how different it right. was. But it's it's going to be interesting to see how they were able to build another separate new documentary out of uh, all of the uh, Imagine material. But, uh, you know, we didn't end up having to wait all that long to see this and i will be uh tuning in mm. needless to say and hopefully i would guess it's pretty safe to bet that we'll have probably a physical dvd blu-ray at some point afterwards yeah uh, probably not oh. too long afterwards too there's going to be a record story day release on the imagine album on vinyl and it's all different takes and raw studio mixes and it's slated for Record Store Day, which is April the 13th. I've been told it's limited to 5,000 copies. All right. And we should mention the Claypool Lennon Delirium album was released on February the 22nd called South of Reality. I hope to be listening to it very soon. Uh, I've only heard uh, a few of the tracks so far, but we'll be talking about it more in upcoming shows. And finally, the late New Orleans blues pianist and singer, Professor Longhair, has a new reissue coming out. It's called Live on the Queen Mary. This was a concert recorded March 24th, 1975, on the Queen Mary uh, cruise ship docked in Long Beach, California, at a party hosted by Paul and Linda McCartney, who underwrote the album. 
It's going to be available on CD and MP3, and it comes out on April the 5th. That's going to be great. Professor Longhair is fabulous, and I can't wait to hear that. Yeah, I think this, this must have been around the time of uh, Venus and Mars when this was done. What was the date again? I heard, March, 24th, was, March 24th, 1975. The day after my 10th birthday. I um, just thought I'd throw that in. So March 75, yeah. Well, Paul, well, they were there for Mardi Gras in New Orleans, which would have been the month earlier, I guess. So maybe it was in March of 75. Uh, so, uh, yeah, that would be right at that point that uh, Paul and Linda and Wings were uh, over uh, here in the States. Or they came back. Right. Hmm. Okay. So finally, we have to make mention of the sad news of the passing of Peter Tork. Uh, who died at the age of 77. We know so many Beatles fans who are Monkees fans, and so many of us are feeling it. After the passing of Davy Jones back in 2012, and now there's just Mickey Dolenz and Mike Nesmith, Peter was an accomplished musician, known for playing the bass, also uh, the keyboards on many of the Monkees tracks, and he played the banjo, in fact, on a little piece that he gave to George Harrison, for the Wonderwall film, which, right. as it turns out, didn't make the soundtrack album, but it was used in the film. And you could actually go on YouTube and just check it out. It's a very short piece. It's uh, less than half a minute. I was not aware that uh, he was sick. I knew that he had a cancer, an issue with cancer back just about or almost 10 years ago. But evidently, he was he had been pretty ill of late from what I'm gathering. Mm -hmm. But I was completely caught off guard when I heard he, that he died. And it was very sad because it was another piece of my youth, your youth, you know, yeah. all of our growing well, years. There's so many things you could say about the monkeys because, I mean, let's face it, they were uh, America's answer in a way to the Beatles. They were modeled after the Beatles and kind of what you had seen in A Hard Day's Night and Help. And they had tremendous personalities on screen. That's one thing you could say about the Monkees and the Beatles, apart from the fact that, certainly in my opinion, they're both great catalogs. But can you think of any other band besides the Beatles and the Monkees where the public got to know their personalities? I mean, the Monkees were in your face every single week for a couple of years on their TV show. Mm -hmm. You got to know each one of them individually. So many bands that are out there, you know who the, the front man is. And you don't know the other members of the band. You might know them by name, but you don't know their personalities. The Monkees benefited from having this TV show. And they had great chemistry, very magnetic on, on the screen. Um, I myself was not the biggest fan of the TV show, but I always, always loved their music. Right. And um, they benefited from having... <laughs> Some of the best songwriters in the business, Brill Building people, like Carol King and Jerry Goffin, Neil Sedaka, Barry Mann, Cynthia Wilde, Boyce and Hart, of course. Uh, even David Gates wrote a song for the Monkees. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so when you've got top songwriters like that and you've got strong material, you know, that's that's a big reason why their music holds up. These are people who are experts at their craft and knew what they were doing. And also the way the monkeys executed it all. I mean, you had, at least in my opinion, I've been saying it for many years, I think Mickey Dolenz is one of the most underrated songwriters we've ever had, you know, in, in rock. He never gets the credit he deserves as a singer. Davy Jones, to me, was a great singer. More of a theatrical background, but uh, great for pop music. And you had two really great musicians in the monkeys, in particular with Mike Nesmith, and Peter Tork and Mike was a real pioneer in country rock. Monkeys are very underrated to me and deserve to get much more uh, respect and acclaim. They're one of the many artists who I believe should be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. But, uh, you know, the, the, the music to me is what matters the most. And uh, it's a very solid catalog. When I was a lot younger, I mainly only knew their hits. Once you go deeper into their catalog and, you know, the album cuts, you realize how strong that music really is. And like I said, because of the songwriters they had and the strong material and how they executed it all. So uh, very sad that, that Peter Tork passed away. So we send out condolences to uh, all the Monkees fans listening to this show. 
Absolutely. And I really enjoyed the Christmas album that came out late last year. So in a way, it was uh, that kind of Peter's dying uh, now. One of the things I thought of was how pleasantly surprised at how good the Christmas album was. Uh, I can't remember the name of it now. Christmas Party, I think. Uh, something to, the, to that effect. But, you know, just so soon after its release, uh, another one of the members is gone. Very sad. So, uh, again, you know, I echo your sentiments. Uh, condolences all around uh, the late Peter Tor. Okay. And that's it for the news. As I said before, we have a special guest with us here on the program today. This is someone who has written a number of books on the Beatles including a new one just in time for another one of those special anniversaries. Seems like there's one every week. Uh, but back in November, we celebrated the 50th anniversary of the release of the White Album. And our guest just wrote a book called The White Album, Revolution, Politics, and Recording, The Beatles and the World in 1968. But he's also authored a few other Beatle books, one called The Official History of Abbey Road Studios, Another one, The Story of Northern Songs. I'd like to get into that a bit on the show. And I believe a couple years ago he wrote a similar book on Sgt. Pepper, just like the one on the White Album, and that is Brian Southall. Brian, welcome to Things We Said Today. Hi, you're welcome. Good to be here. Good to be here. Nice to have you, Brian. And, uh, you know, I'm, I, I started writing down, before we started the show, in my notes here, all the books that you've written. And I'm now on the uh, fifth page of paper here. Uh, <laughs> I mean, that was just in a nutshell, those books that Ken uh, mentioned, because there's also, you wrote about Bob Dylan and the Sex Pistols and the Hollies, and it sounds as though you're basically pumping out a book every week. <laughs> <laughs> I think I've done about 20 or 21 now, I think, and I'm, I'm about near retirement age, you know. Yeah, I've done a few Sex Pistols, I did the Bee Gees, uh, <laughs> The, the Rise and Fall of EMI, which was a fun one, because I worked there for 15 years, so that was fun. Northern Songs, as you say, Abbey Road. Oh, a couple of, oh the, the, the Hollies. Uh, yeah. oh, a book called Dream Boats and Petticoats, which won't mean anything in America, but it was a story about the arrival of rock and roll from America in this country in the 50s and talking to people about how it was welcomed, not welcomed by the establishment, by the kids and whatever else. So that was sort of fun. I had a long conversation with people like Neil Sadaka and, and Dwayne Eddy you know, oh, wow. who came over who came over here and, and their first experiences of uh, of London in the in the late fifties um, and what they thought of our rock and roll uh, efforts. So that was a sort of fun book. So yeah there's 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 a there's a you know there's quite a wide range of them. There may be another one next year which are which you'll find out about next year and uh, whether that's a lot or not I don't know. We'll see. All I right. think we're all going to have to make an effort to have our own Brian Southall room. <laughs> so we can uh, we could have uh, on the shelves in this room all of your books. So, you know, I do what I mean. Like. <laughs> You're covering a lot of territory there. Let me just go through a little bit of your resume here, because I have you down for working at A&M Records and you also worked at EMI. You worked in press promotion, marketing, artist development and corporate communications. Then you were a consultant for Warner Brothers International, the HMV Group, and the British yep. Photographic Industry. Were you writing these books while you were doing this, or was it all after? You missed a bit before A&M, because I was also a journalist on Melody Maker and, and, and Disc, which were two music papers over here in mm -hmm. the which were very big. I worked at uh, Melody Maker and, and Disc in the late 60s and the early 70s, and then I joined A&M Records uh, and worked with the Carpenters, and then I came to EMI to work with uh, as head of press for the Motown label, which was licensed through uh, EMI, which meant working with Stevie Wonder and Smokey and all that lot. Um, oh, and I moved, <laughs> then I moved into EMI itself and became sort of head of their press office, which was which was Paul McCartney, Wings, Queen, Pink Floyd, eventually the Sex Pistols, Kate Bush. It was all that sort of era, which was which was great fun. At 15 years there, doing lots of things, and then went to then left and became a consultant, as you said, to HMV Group, to Warner Music International, the IFPI, which was the international music industry body, and and the BPI. 
and then I joined, then I gave all that up and joined Warner's full time in in about 2000, and then I finally left in 2003. Um, not to be a full time writer, I just left with some some fairly sizable pay packets. I'm glad to say, uh, <laughs> and, and some share options. And then, yeah, I started. The first book I did was 1982, which was the Abbey Road book. When I was fortunate enough to spend time with George Martin and and Paul McCartney, talking about Abbey Road and the Beatles, and 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 with a lot of other people who worked there, obviously over the it was the 50th anniversary of Abbey Road. And I, you know, I wrote a bunch of books while I was still working at uh, at uh, EMI, and what I did a, a history of uh, an A to Z of record labels because I was quite fascinated by those and a few other books. And yeah, I sort of, you know, I do a book when people ask me to do a book. <laughs> hmm. Now, you mentioned Paul McCartney and also George Martin. Did you have a strong relationship with them? Uh, well, they may have a different view. Um, I mean, I worked at EMI from 70, 1974, so the Beatles were you know, non-existent by then, as it were. Uh, John was obviously in New York, and he was the only one I never met or, or worked with, because I obviously worked on their various solo projects. I, the Motown press office was within EMI, and that was where I went in 1974. But within about 18 months, Motown had left EMI, and then I moved over to run the EMI division press office, uh, which involved me working with uh, Ringo, George, uh, and Paul on their various uh, solo efforts, and with uh, with John by telegram and uh, the odd postcard. Uh, he was a great, as you probably know, he was a great writer of postcards, and uh, this was before emails. We also had telegrams, and uh, when I spent some time with Julian, he also recalled that his dad used to send him lots of postcards. He, John, John liked a postcard. Hmm. Um, many of which were, were, were quite rude in what he said about us. Uh, <laughs> uh, he spent a lot of time, yeah, he's, where where we failed with his records, he would tell us so in a, in a postcard or a telegram, which was the era of, um, oh, what, uh, rock and roll music, uh, shave fish, uh, that sort of period when I was working with on his records. Ringo wasn't around much. We had a couple of albums that I worked on. He came in a, you know, a few times. George, I worked on extra texture with George. Um, as his, he didn't hire an outside press officer. He had me to do his press, although he didn't want to talk to anybody, so that was fine. Mm. Uh, and, yeah. I did do it. I, he did one interview with Ray Coleman, who was the very um, esteemed editor of Melody Maker. Sure. Um, and my old boss and a friend of mine and and George because he knew Ray from the the days of the the Beatles in the sixties, he agreed to be interviewed by uh, by Ray. So we went down to Dark Horse Records and spent an afternoon down there doing an interview. And one of the great one of the great quotes I remember that Ray we were sitting in the room and Ray said to George, "What's it like being an ex-Beatle?" And George said, "Marginally better than being an ex-Nazi." <laughs> 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 Um, well, as, you know, it's on the record that George was not at his happiest being a Beatle. He, he was very happy when he wasn't a Beatle, as it were. Didn't like touring, didn't like all that stuff. So, but he he was we had he was he was great fun. I, I, you may be interested to know a humorous story that I came back EMI in those days was Manchester Square, where the fir, where the first record cover for Please Please Me in England was photographed. Mm -hmm. uh, we came up in, a, in his in his BMW limousine with uh, his driver come security man George and myself and we all went in the building and George wanted to go to the toilet and I wasn't quite sure you know what you did when a beetle wants to go to the men's room do you go with him does he go and he, I don't know you know <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and he said no, it's all right. You know, and he went off with his with his uh, security guy into the sort of ground floor men's toilet at EMI, and I went upstairs to the first floor, which is in fact where that sergeant, that please please me album cover was taken on that very landing, and across the landing at me came the man who was the managing director of EMI Records, not my direct boss, because I was a bit down the scale. So he was about five bosses removed from me. And I knew who he was. He obviously didn't know who the hell I was. And then someone had told him that George was coming into the building. And he came across and held his hand out and, and he was Dutch. And he just said to me, hello, George, it is good to meet you. Hmm. And I went, he thinks I'm George Harrison. <laughs> I had very long hair and a beard. And I suddenly realized this, this guy who's my boss thinks I'm George Harrison. Oh, God. <laughs> uh, you should have said, no, 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 it, I'm Ringo. Well, I was going to get a, a royalty check and, and leave immediately. Uh, 
<laughs> and I said, no, no. And because he was foreign, I, you know, I shouted at him because that's what English people do with foreigners. We shout. <laughs> so I just said to him, me no George. George him wee wee. Uh, he, <laughs> uh, he just went, oh, yeah, very good. And walked off. And I just stood there. And then I was going into a meeting with, with George and, and, and my immediate boss. And I said to my boss, is Jerry Ord, who was the man in question, is he coming to the meeting with George Harrison? And he said, yes, he is. And I said, well, I can't come. He said, why not? I said, because he thinks I'm George Harrison. Uh, so <laughs> I, I left. The, I didn't go into the meeting until Jerry Ord left. And then we explained to George Harrison why I wasn't there, which he thought was hilarious. Uh, <laughs> at that later stage, I went down to Apple and Jonathan Clyde told me that George went back to the office and told them a huge story about me being his double and being mistaken for him by my boss. Uh, <laughs> Was uh, yeah, which was quite fun. He was a lovely man, George. He was a lovely man. We had uh, we had we had a good time on that record. It wasn't that successful, and it was his last one for EMI. But in answer to your question, I then spent more time working with Paul because he obviously stayed with EMI for the longest period uh, uh, and would come in. And you know, we had London Town, and we had uh, oh, oh, I can't remember what albums there were in that time. But you know, through the seventies. Uh, yeah, and we, you know, he came in and and, and we had uh, the single with uh, Michael Jackson and Stevie Wonder and all that period and touring with Wings and the various Wings groups that there were. So yeah, he he would he would he would come in and have a chat and bring his uh, bring his records in for his, us to hear and pass comment on, but we weren't necessarily supposed to criticise. It wasn't a great thing to tell him that it wasn't very good. Uh, so we learned that very quick. we learned very quickly not to say. I don't like that. Uh, <laughs> so we sort of, you know, in, this was by by this time, you know, as you know, if you follow the record industry, there was a period of time when the, as they say, the lunatics took over the asylum, you know, in that the record companies lost the control that they had in the 60s in terms of, you know, the Beatles were in the studio with George every year, every week making this, you know, the, and, and by the time we got to the Eagles and Pink Floyd and, the bands and Queen, they decided what they were going to reduce, what they were going to record, what they were going to release. The, you know, they decided everything. Uh, and the record companies got less and less involved in those major superstar acts. So there wasn't a lot of point in coming in and playing us stuff because Paul had, you know, like put like Floyd and Queen and had decided what the single was going to be and decided what the cover would be and decided what the album would be and decided. So we just sat and went, yeah, OK, fine, you know, and got on with it. So it was that sort of relationship, which had changed a lot from from the sixties period. When and I and I did spend time with George Martin. I, I interviewed him for the Abbey Road book, and obviously because you know he had been at EMI and and his wife Judy had been at EMI. You know we you know you didn't become firm friends, but everywhere you know I would see George pretty regularly, and we'd have a long chat and a conversation. And he, he used to drop me letters asking me questions or ring me up saying, oh you know so and so wants to know this that and the other because he didn't he didn't have a great memory for things that he had done. Uh, and he would mm. ring sort of me up and go, when do we actually do that? And have you got any record of that? It was a sort of interesting conversation. You could make this great music, not just with the Beatles, because he made, you know, records with other people as well, but he, he didn't sort of keep a diary of it. And he didn't, you know, and he would need to be reminded of what he was doing. Because it was, you know, as Ken Townsend said, you know, when Ken who was an engineer at Abbey Road and then eventually ran it, you know, Ken would say, if we'd known how famous the Beatles were going to be, we'd have kept every piece of toilet paper and every teacup they ever touched. You know, <laughs> but no, no one knew that it was going to, we were still going to be talking about this stuff 50 years on. You know, they were just another band. And then they realised that they were something special. But, you know, George was making Silver Black records, he was making Billy Joe Kramer records, he was, you know, uh, and, and it all sort of melds into it. If you look back to how many records they made and how many sessions they did and that you know it, it, it sort of you can understand why he sort of got confused about it all um mm. you know there were occasions when we'd sort of clarify the date and, and where it was and so on and so forth. but george was george was just a, a very very lovely man most sweet man it, it reminds me a bit of session musicians that i've interviewed that have done thousands of sessions and you can't expect them to remember everything because they've done so but, much in a short period of time too so well the other if you talk to people who were not rock and roll session musicians, he's not sort of rock drummers, not the, the, the guys we all know, you know, Bobby Keys and Keltner and all those people. If you, if you were classical musicians, and I you know, spoke to a few over the time, who would get brought in to play uh, you know, on string 
arrangements of, of various people's records, whether it was Cliff Bridges or the Hollies or whatever, they sort of didn't know what the hell they were playing on because no one ever told them. They basically came in for a three-hour session, played 20 bars of music as a 25-piece, 30-piece orchestra with someone conducting it, and then they left. They didn't necessarily hear what record it was going on. Ugh. I know musicians who went, I didn't know I was on that. Hmm. <laughs> And then they went off to another session in the, in the afternoon and then another session in the evening. And that's what that's what they did. And uh, Brian, I have a question uh, regarding uh, your time with A&M Records. Yeah. And I know that when George started up Dark Horse Records, it was an A&M subsidiary until uh, sometime like midway through 1976. Were you involved at all with A&M when Dark Horse uh, was over at that label? I'm trying to think. I left and um, I joined EMI in uh, April 1974. And I know because right. I don't know when he started Dark Horse. Uh, it was oh, actually well, Splinter. Yeah. Splinter was through AM, I think. So, yes, we did, I had no involvement with him, but I think, wasn't it Splinter? Wasn't that that was Splinter? And I think that came through AM as a. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah, uh, it was. A, I think it was a sort of license deal in those days. If you formed an independent record company, uh, where you had no factory and no manufacturing, and you had no sales force, and you had, you know, no great marketing expertise. I mean, EMI had a whole thing called a license label division, which dealt with all these labels, uh, American labels mainly, MCA and, and Island Records in the UK, and Motown and Stax and a few other record, record labels who didn't have all the facilities of a record company. So they would be licensed through a major like EMI or DECA or CBS or whatever. And they had they had use of our sort of manufacturing, our sales force, our marketing people. And for that, they they, they paid an, you know, an amount of money or royalty, for, which is how we worked with Motown for years at EMI. And I think uh, Dark Horse was, was like that with A&M. And eventually, I think he, 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 well, George eventually moved to Warners, didn't he? The, the, right. The, yeah. Yeah. yeah, in 76, and yeah. I think it was, uh, uh, there was, it was a lawsuit. Well, he I'm left sorry. EMI to Extra Texture in 76, and then I think he signed to Warners. Right, exactly. And your time at EMI uh, also incorporated uh, the last days of Apple, those records that you pointed out, like Rock and Roll and Shaved Fish, and those were and Extra Texture, those were Apple releases, but... At that time, would you say that Apple was more just a label than a functioning company? Well, up until the contract that the Beatles had signed with, uh, I think, the, with Brian Epstein died in 67. I just said the last Beatles contract would, would expired when George left at the end of that contract, which was signed i think with brian epstein in late 60s they were actually out of contract when they released sergeant pepper bizarre because they hadn't done the deal but they re-signed a deal which was so 67 to 70 it was a nine-year deal i think in which they were required to make they agreed to make 70 sides of music how it was going to be broken down into albums or singles was was arguable but that was they were always of course which is why that whole issue about the the PCS number and that sort of thing, they were always signed as the Beatles to EMI. Mm -hmm. So EMI allowed, once they'd formed Apple and created the Apple label, EMI allowed them to put the Apple logo on their records, although they were never signed to Apple as a group. Right. So, you know, the, the Apple was there, but it didn't, it, you know, it had... It had uh, Badfinger and it had uh, Mary Hopkin and, and, and various other bands on it and James Taylor, of course. The Beatles didn't move on to it themselves uh, until their EMI contract expired in 1976. OK, gotcha. uh, we, we did allow them to use it because they wanted to use Apple as their logo. And, but they would always have PCS, which was a parlophone prefix, of course. Right, 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 right. Uh, in America, it was still capital, I think, uh, obviously, in America. Until, but, it, but it was a worldwide deal, so they, they left at the end of that 76 deal. And Paul ended up being the only one to remain, as you mentioned, with EMI once the mid-70s set in and Apple was finished. Uh, basically, yes. John had sort of retired. We did try and you know, spend time. I, you know, I didn't meet him, but we did, you know, guys I who were my colleagues and my 
the the executives at EMI spent time with 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 John in New York trying to get him to release a record or you know do something or re-sign of course, which he wasn't going to do because he was being a a stay-at-home dad with Julian and baking the bread and all that stuff. So we tried with that. Ringo, you know, Ringo was was not the biggest selling solo artist we ever had. So, you know, when he decided that it was no longer appropriate, then I don't think anyone fought that hard. George uh, George had a left EMI as a sort of half a matter of principle. He, he didn't like EMI, not necessarily us in EMI Records or the people. He was not very happy with EMI as a limited company, which was involved. It had a defense uh, division. Uh, I never quite worked out what the difference between defense and attack was because it made things that killed people, but they basically said they made them to defend rather than to attack. So they made you know, uh, armaments and they made mines and they made in this defense division. And and George, of course, you know, with Harry Krishna and his great, you know, his his strong religious beliefs, was not enamoured of, of EMI being involved in that particular business. So when his contract came up, I don't think it was we all knew there was little or no chance of him ever re-signing and Paul yeah Paul stayed uh, stayed the course um, for whatever reasons I think he I think he liked EMI he certainly you know when I did the Abbey Road book I mean he he liked the history of EMI he liked quite he quite liked being involved with EMI he liked he loved Abbey Road and you know maybe being you know the the only kid on the block as it were out of the four gave him a you know a, a, a strong position and he was the one who was going to make more records you know you knew that's what he wanted to do you know Ringo was sort of here and there he'd, he'd be messing about George was you know would would want to spend a lot of time doing the Harry Krishna and stuff and he was also getting into movies of course with with, with his film company um John was doing nothing so you you know you knew that Paul was going to be the most prolific because you know that's what he wanted to do and he continues to do that to this day, so re-signing Paul was 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 an interesting coup. Yeah, and we, you know, he he would come in the office pretty regularly. We'd have quite a few meetings and 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 stuff. He was, you know, he was he was pretty amenable in that respect. And and um, uh, although you know, he never called upon the services of of EMI in terms of record promotion or press office. He always had his own independent people doing that. So, but in terms of marketing, we were pretty much involved in in the marketing um, campaigns, although, you know, one of Paul's great, you know, interests and expertise was was marketing and images and concepts, you know, hence Sergeant Pepper was very much a concept from Paul and, and the idea of going to the white cover for the White Album was, was again, very much uh, 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 through Paul, who, who met Richard Hamilton through, through the uh, Robert Fraser Art Gallery, where Paul had got very involved with Miles in uh, in in the the world of art and and imagery and you know and sort of wanted to carry that through you know the Abbey Road cover was was a although the photographer was brought was a friend of John and Yoko's the idea the original sketch for you know across the crossing and something like that was was a poor idea he, he, you know he he did have a, a an eye and a. a uh, a, a bent towards uh, marketing and imagery and presentation. Hmm. Just going back to, to what you were saying about Paul and, and marketing him. So your job really was to set up interviews for him and not necessarily uh, approach the radio stations. You only no, in, in England no, no. you only had a few, right? Well, we had com- we had cap- we had commercial radio stations around the country by then, which were in the, you know we had. If, you know, 15 major cities, if you like, you know, Edinburgh, Glasgow, Birmingham, Newcastle, Leeds, Burton, Manchester, you know, all the major mm. cities and provinces would have a would have a major independent radio station back then. And the BBC was starting up some local radio station. But we had, you know, for us, and, you know, if, if you're I know trying to explain this to American artists and American managers back at the time was difficult. We had Radio One. And Radio One was a national radio station that broadcast right across the United Kingdom. Now, you know, that's not a lot when you look at America, but America didn't have, I don't believe, a national radio station, as it were, because, again, yours was city-led and so on and so forth. Mm-hmm. So this one, you know, and, and you tried to, I remember trying to explain to Bob Seger's manager, you know, you, you, the Bob's new record is, you know, he's got 17 plays in one week on Radio One. 
And again, you know, well, fine. We got twenty-seven players in Detroit last week, and you went, yeah, you, you, it's just it's about different. 17, 17, 18 players on Radio One in a week was a massive event. You know, this was this was saturation for this country. But Paul, no, Paul hired, uh, retained his own independent press office, uh, a company, and had his own independent radio promotion person company that he hired. So we didn't do any. We, you know, we made the records and we pressed the records and we put them in the things and we sent them out to uh, a lot of journalists on an automatic system that we had to send all the records out to the people at the radio stations and so on and so forth. But the plugging, if you like, of that record and whether Paul was going to go into Radio One and do an interview or whether Paul was going to sit with, you know, Melody Maker and do an interview was set up by the guys that he employed, which weren't within EMI. And that was pretty much you know, the way that most of the major acts in, in, in this country worked with the record companies. Queen had their own independent PR people and radio people, and oh, Floyd didn't have anybody because he didn't talk to anybody. Uh, they didn't, <laughs> and they, they didn't sing, so that didn't matter. But it was it was the way it worked. It was independent, independent radio promotion, independent press was, that was a very big business in this country. So, you know, when you were running the EMI press office, you were, you know, you were dealing with the acts that were up and coming, as it were, rather than those that were at a, a at an established level, you would facilitate stuff. You would be sending stuff out. You'd deal with a phone call if someone didn't know how to get hold of Paul McCartney. You would ring the uh, my office and say, "Oh, did Paul going to do anything?" You'd put them onto the right person. We at that time were focusing on people like Kate Bush, uh, Tom Robinson's punk band, uh, uh, the Sex Pistols, of course. So the bands that were up and coming were what we focused a lot of our time on. Uh, in trying to break those acts to follow on from the ones that were sort of disappearing as they got older and and, and less popular. Mm. I know we want to ask, uh, you know, talk to you about your most recent book on the White yeah. Album, but one more thing to, to mm. uh, if you could shed light on uh, Paul McCartney's relationship with Capitol Records here in the United States, which was, I guess you could say, the, the, the uh, leading label of EMI label in this country, Paul had a falling out with Capital, and uh, I guess at some point towards late 78 and left, but remained an EMI artist overseas from, from us here in the U.S. Uh, is there any light you could shed on the dispute that McCartney had with specifically with Capital uh, come the late 70s? I don't know. No, I honestly can't tell you what the, what that dispute was about. Um, it may just have been the fact that, you know, there was a better deal to be had down the road. You know, CBS, who he eventually signed to, were very generous in their uh, in their, their deal with him, uh, not just in terms of money, but also in terms of the acquisition of certain song titles for his for his publishing operation. You know, remembering that his father-in-law was a was a very uh, strong and important uh, lawyer in the world of music publishing, and right. Paul. Paul had uh, seen the light in terms of music publishing. He lived to regret that in terms of Northern Songs and Paul and Michael Jackson, perhaps. But you know, the, he had seen. You know, he he knew all about music publishing and 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 what it was worth and what songs were worth. And uh, I, I, there were some just a lot of it. Sort of went back to. Capital had never treated the Beatles particularly well, as you know, the whole sort of Dave Dexter stuff and all that, and, right. and the record label, the record track listings were changed. They, you know, they bought they bore that grudge for quite a while. They, they, you know, they didn't like that. Although, you know, by this time, of course, it was a whole different management company and a whole different uh, structure. So um, I don't know that he that he was upset by anything in particular. But I think, you know, CBS were a very strong company at that time. And, you know, the, you know, the deal was on the table to, uh, to, for him to maybe take a move. I, you know, I mean, what, what I, you know, what was interesting is that when he eventually came back to capital in America after that, so the, one of the things that his, fa his father-in-law negotiated, of course, was the, the fact that he then got him Love Me Do and P.S. I Love You back into Paul's publishing empire. Hmm. Because they, you know, if if you, there were four songs that were not within the Northern Songs catalogue that was eventually bought by Mag Michael Jackson and eventually went to Sony. There was Love Me Do and P.S. I Love You. 
and it was Please Please Me and Ask Me Why. And those four songs were out, were bizarrely, the first two, Love Me Do and the, and the B-Side, were published by EMI's publishing company in England, Ardmore and Beechwood, which was a subsidiary of EMI. Mm-hmm. And Brian Epstein was very unimpressed with their efforts because in those days the music published were more important record people did record companies didn't have pluggers in those days the pluggers were basically with the publishers and he was very impressed with that so he went off to see dick james and dick james got them their first national television broadcast i think in early 1963 when brian took uh, an acetate or uh, of recording of please please be two um Dick James's office, and Dick picked up the phone and, and rang a mate of his who was the producer of a national TV program based in Birmingham called Thank You Lucky Stars, and he played it down the phone, put it on a record player, and played it down the phone to the producer, who said, "Oh yeah, yeah." So he and he booked the Beatles on the basis of that phone call and hearing it down the phone, and as a thank you for Dick doing that, he not only did the Northern Songs deal with Brian Epstein and John and Paul. But Brian Epstein gave him the publishing to Please Please Me and the B-Side, mm. uh, which is why that was out of the Michael Jackson thing. It's now owned by Universal because Dick James died and his company was taken over by his son, Stephen, and Stephen sold Dick James Music because it was part of Dick James Music rather than Northern Songs, and that was eventually bought by Universal, which is why they own those two sides. Love Me Do and P.S. And PS I Love You was within EMI's publishing house, and when... Paul was being tempted back to Capital. They gave him the publishing on on those two tracks. So those are the only two Lennon McCartney songs that Paul actually owns. Well, I guess that uh, you've uh, got to the bottom of uh, why in the late '80s Paul actually put did a medley of the two songs and mm-hmm. called it mm-hmm. "P.S. Love Me Do." There you go. <laughs> yeah. Uh, bizarrely, when you look at the whole publishing, you know, the, the, the num- 250 of whatever number of songs they wrote and Lennon and McCartney, excluding Harrison, you know, he owns two of them. <laughs> <laughs> Which is pretty sad, but there you go. You know. Yeah, yeah. The legend is, uh, the story is uh, very briefly getting back to Paul leaving mm. um, Capital in the U.S. was that he was very unhappy with the way the Mull of Kintyre girls' school single was handled here in the U.S., uh, Mull of Kintyre, uh, an enormously successful record around the world, and basically a dud in the U.S. In fact, I think Girls' Hello? School side that charted in this, and even that was kind of had a very um, uh, modest success in this country, and that was what we heard. At least I was well, quite, quite, quite possibly. Yeah. I'm, sure, I'm sure that he was disappointed. I mean, he was disappointed about it. We, we we know that from our own conversations, but at the same time, you know, there was. We took the view that why would anyone in America understand a record about a place in Scotland with a bunch of bagpipes on it? You know, right. I mean, it was it was a particular. I mean, nobody in this country liked it. <laughs> we we all worked on it and hated it. Uh, but but Mark and Mark became the biggest selling single in the UK up until that point. Doesn't make it the best. <laughs> well, the, <laughs> the public must have liked it. Oh, the, yeah, whatever. I mean, you know, we all went. Oh, really? OK, you know, it was a matter of opinion. But he, yeah, I'm sure he was disappointed. And in view of that enormous success in, in Britain and, of course, probably in, in around Europe as well, I'm sure he was disappointed that, that, that what America did or didn't achieve with it. And Girls' School was probably better suited to American radio, I think. Would you, would you not agree in terms of yes. being, you know, um, you know uh, a rock pop track more so? But you know, there's, there's not you know one has to say there's not you can't always please the artist you know uh, <laughs> you, you know one I've got a bunch of stories which you won't go into now about you know artists you know not realizing or eventually realizing that you know what they asked you to do with a particular record was probably too much at, when they look back on it and think you know that actually it wasn't the best record I ever made and you went at the time you told me it was the best record you'd ever made. <laughs> Uh, and you expected me to get it, you know, to do this, this, this with it. And then two years later, you tell me, yeah, probably not great. So, you know, there's lots of those things that go on. So I, I'm sure that, yeah, that, I mean, if you, I, I have no reason to disagree that he had a sort of fit of peak about all that. And, you know, it doesn't take much for people to, to leave. Maybe he wanted a reason to leave. I don't know. You know, it's, it's speculation. I, I have no idea. But, yeah. Yeah, the, the, what I had heard, Darren, was that Capitol Records didn't believe in Mullet Kintyre that it could right. be a big hit in America. 
Not that they didn't but, like the song or anything. They just felt that it wouldn't win over an audience here. So, I, you know, would, that's why yeah. they, they pushed Girl School instead. And Girl School know. made the top 40 in America, but it didn't. Right. It wasn't a huge hit. Should have been, though. <laughs> Oh, you can, you know, you, 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 you can see where they were coming from in terms of, you know, Mullah Kintyre in America. Why, why would, you know, why would it? And, and, you know, I'm sure Paul didn't necessarily agree with that view. But, you know, that, that, that's, that, those sort of arguments will continue long into the night between artists and record companies. <laughs> hmm. So getting into your book on the White Album. Yes, um, for, for people that don't know, this book is a combination of a lot of things. You do give information about all the individual songs that are on the White Album. But I think perhaps what you try to bring out is more everything that happened in the year 1968 in the world as this album was being released and even before that. And we're talking about politically, yeah. the entertainment world, the sports world, people who were born on specific dates who died on specific dates, the, the songs that were in the top 10 in both the U.S. and the U.K. simultaneously. So my question to you is certainly on a political or sociological front, other than the song Revolution, how did the events of 1968, in your view, the events around the world, affect the Beatles' music for the White Album, if at all? I don't think it affected the music on the album very much at all, apart from, as you say, probably revolution. And, and you know, the famous story with that is that, you know, John couldn't make up his mind whether he wanted one or not, uh, which mm. is why there are versions about, you know, he will, he won't, there will be, there won't be, you know, because he couldn't, you know, he famously didn't want to necessarily be seen to be leading a revolution. But I think he, you know, would quite like to see some change in the against the uh, the organized political world that he obviously you know wasn't happy with so but he was very conscious of you know I, you know there, there was a guy called Tariq Ali here who was a great sort of uh, you know dissident and revolutionary and anarchist and whatever and he tried to get and he hung around with the, with Jagger and with Lennon and well he tried to get Lennon involved in in his political movement which was a lot of protests about education a lot of protests about the government and so on and so forth and John was very I mean he you know he, John was no fool he was very wary of it Mm. Uh, and very wary of being seen to be used in that respect. He may well have agreed, he may well, and he had his own thoughts, but he was very conscious of not being seen to be, you know, used as a puppet in, the, in, in these things. If he wanted to say things, he would say them, you know, in his own way, with his own statements, as he did with the with the, the, the beddings and the lovings and the peace, and he, that was his way of doing it. I don't think the album particularly is affected directly by what went on in 1968. I think they were, they were, they were sort of removed from it in a way, you know, remembering they went, you know, that they, they had lost Brian Epstein. They were, you know, in the middle of trying to run a business as well as run themselves, as well as make music. And that, that was, you know, confusing for them as well, because, you know, they, they, they relied on Brian. They may not have agreed with every deal he ever did, but, you know, they, they, they did rely on him a lot. And as Ringo once said, you know, we'd never seen a contract before. You know, we'd never read them. Paul John's, you know, Brian said, you know, you should sign this and we signed it, you know, because they had, you know, complete faith in him. You know, the, the one thing that Brian Epstein was, was he was never, never in any way a, a, a crook or, you know, in any way a fraud. He was 100% committed to the band. He may have been naive. He may have made some poor decisions, particularly with the with the, uh, the uh, marketing and the uh, of Beatles related product in America with the famous um, deal he did over there. But, I, you know, he never tried to rip anybody off. So I think they understood him completely and trusted him completely. But they've now got this new sort of baggage to carry around. And they were unquestionably, you know, Yoko was on the scene now, which was, you know, you talk to people who were in the studio while the album was being made. And they, you know, there was no question that this was becoming more and more difficult. John was being more and more drawn towards Yoko, which led him away from the others in the band. And they would distance themselves from her, particularly because they didn't like having them in the studio, because that was something that never happened before. You know, the studio was sacrosanct. It was the four of them with, with George and anyone else that they particularly wanted there. You know, their sessions were closed sessions. They were very private sessions. So they were going through all that. 
Then, you know, India arrived and they went off to India and they said, there's nothing else to do over there but write songs. You know, <laughs> so they wrote a lot of songs, um, you know, far too many, some might say. Uh, and they came back and, and put them all together on an album. I, who knows? I mean, George had, you know, particular uh, views about world peace, uh, peace and love and, and his following of the mystics and Indian religion. John had his views about how this stuff should go on. I, I, I don't know that Ringo or Paul ever explained how they thought about the politics of the day and stuff like that. So I, I don't think they were directly influenced in any way whatsoever. I, you know, they were the they were influenced by events that were close to them. You know, the things that they saw, the things that were happening around them in a way. And also at the same time, you know, being able to write songs that were just great songs, you know. I, is back in the USSR anything to do with Russia? You know, is it, or is it, you know, a Beach Boys song? Um, <laughs> you know, Obladi Oblada, well, you know, that's a sort of Jamaican reggae thing, come, pop hit by Paul, you know. None of this stuff has, I don't think, any, any, you know, happiness is a warm gun. People read all sorts of things into stuff like that. And people saying, well, John was reading a magazine about guns, you know, and, right. and all this headline that said happiness is a warm gun after you've been out shooting a deer or, you know, bear or buffalo or whatever, you know, Rocky Raccoon, you know, a lot of these songs are just very, very, you know, personal to them and the circumstances they were in, you know, the continuing story of Bungalow Bill and all, you know. So uh, Helter Skelter, you know, some of them were just great rock songs. So I don't think, they, I'm obviously they were aware of it because you could not, you know, you couldn't be aware, you had to be aware of what was going on, particularly with the protests with the Vietnam War and the politics around the world, that there were protests in London, there were protests in Europe, there were, you know, everywhere you went, the, the, the people were protesting, France was in complete disarray with a massive strike, etc. But I don't think, I don't think they tried to translate any of that, in, particularly into songs, you know. Mm. No, I would agree with you. I'd agree with you on that. Various people have read a lot into a, a, you know, a lot of songs, <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, and only they know, you know, you know, Savoy truffles about Eric Clapton loving chocolate, you know. <laughs> what, what I enjoy the most about your book is there's a, there's a, a section in there on the reaction to the album yeah. when it first came out, and you've got people in the music press and yeah. how they felt, and it's mixed. As you would expect, not everybody thought it was the greatest thing, and some people did. But uh, I really enjoyed reading those, and and uh, it was kind of no surprise to me what Jeff Emmerich had to say, since Jeff had to leave the sessions anyway. He wasn't happy there, but um, I just want to read a quote from him. It says, personally, I think it's their least inspired effort, and I find it difficult to listen to. There was little finesse. The group seemed to be simply trying to get something out of their system. <laughs> That's all that he had to say about that. But I really enjoy hearing what those people said at the time of its release. And they might think differently now, some of these people, obviously, if they're still alive. But um, I enjoyed reading all that stuff. And there's one yeah. particular one. So there's one who said uh, Lennon and McCartney. Oh, Tony Palmer said it. Yes. Lennon and McCartney are the greatest songwriters since Schubert. And yeah. the album should surely see the last vestiges of cultural snobbery and bourgeois prejudice swept away in a deluge of joyful music making. <laughs> and certainly, uh, he shared his opinion right there, Tony Palmer. Uh, uh, another revered writer called uh, William Mann on the Times said that suggested that Lennon McCarthy had ceased to progress as songwriters. You know. <laughs> Uh, Alan Parsons, a producer and leader of the Alan Parsons Project, you know, he, he summed it up perfectly. I think he just said, there's some of my favourite Beatles songs on there and there's some of my least favourite Beatles songs on there. And I think for a lot of people, you know, that, that sort of sums it up. You know, Ray, Ray Conley, who's a, 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 a great author and grew up with the Beatles of the 60s, interviewing them and just written a very fine book on John Lennon, which you may have seen. You know, he, he looked at it and just said it was the first the proof that the Fab Four weren't the happy beat quartet of fond memory. You know, uh, they were moving on. And one of the things that was interesting, uh, you know, I was, uh, I mean, the White Album was an album, interesting enough at the time, as I said in the introduction, sort of passed me by. I had left home 
for the first time and 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 then work, working as a journalist on local papers and was living you know in a in a flat in a house in in uh, where I had no record player uh, I had a radio my the record player was at my parents house and in those days you had sort of one record player and that was it uh, and I had a radio of course but you know the white album didn't have a single so you know it, it wasn't played on radio one because it was an album you know which they didn't play so it was an album that sort of passed me by in a way um, you know, you heard odd bits here and there, but it wasn't, you know, and I was busy being a sports editor on a local paper, you know, out doing football matches and this, that and the other and, you know, making a career for myself. And it sort of passed me by um, and I got into it some while later and then I got back into it when I was doing the book. And But, you know, we are, one of my favourite tracks is, is, you know, I love Richie Haven's version of Rocky Raccoon, which I always picked up on. I love back in the USSR. But there were some things I'd sort of forgotten about and, and had passed me by. But I think a, a lot of people read a lot of stuff into it. Um, some of it, they may have been correct. Some of it, they may not have been. I don't know. You know, is, is that the Beatles were, were they, they were undoubtedly in some sort of disarray. Did they hate each other? I don't think so. Were they going different musical directions? Yes. You know, it was obvious from people who were there at the time, Chris Thomas and Ken Townsend or whatever, so, you know, that these guys came in on their own, made records on their own. Went, you know, at one point they were using three different studios in Abbey Road with, you know, three of them in you know, a different studio making a different record. You know, George just, you know, played While My Guitar Gently Weeps, which didn't impress anybody. So went and got Eric Clapton to come in and went, you know, if you don't like it, boys, he's on it. You know, he's my mate. Um, yeah. And there was a... You know, there was some of that going on, a, a sort of one-upmanship. But I, I think they had, I, you know, it's unquestionably, it, it, without doubt, they had stopped being a group. You know, they had stopped being a foursome that sat around with George. And, you know, and it's, you know, George said, George Martin said, you know, he, it should have been one good album as opposed to two, you know, in different albums. Uh, whether he, you know, I know Ken Womack has a view that, you know, George, sort of got fed up and went on holiday and, you know, didn't care about the album. He may well have become a bit disillusioned about it. I don't know. But it was certainly, a, you know, it was a, it was a step in a, in a new direction to have that many songs in, 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 that, in that short of time to, you know, to sit in the studio and bang your way through all this stuff, take after take of trying to get this, that, this, that, that. Uh, and, and George trying to work out what you do with it and one in one studio, one in another, Jeff Emmerich obviously falling out with them. Chris Thomas coming in, which didn't help the Jeff Emmerich situation. I mean, Chris Thomas had a great time. He's a man, one man in the world who loved the whole experience. Mm -hmm. You know, he's 21 years old and he's producing the Beatles, for God's sake. You know, uh, he's in heaven. And at one point he said, you know, I'm 21 years of age. I've produced the Beatles and now I'm playing on a Beatles track being produced with the Beatles, being produced by George Martin. You know, I, you know, it doesn't get much better than that for a 21 year old. Oh, yeah. So he. He had a great time, but you know it was, without question, it's it's not a it's not an uh, an album that sits easily, I think, on the ear. But I I, I don't know how much, uh, you know, you can spend your time analysing all this stuff, trying to work out what it means, what it doesn't mean. You know, are they getting back at somebody? Is a, is that an angry track? Is that a is that a you know? Well, we know, se I mean, sexy Sadie, which we know, you know, now was about. Uh, the Maharishi and the rumours of, of his behaviour towards Mia Farrow's cousin, I think it was. Well, that was reviewed in the paper as being, a, a, you know, a forlorn love song about a, a girl called Sadie. Because no one knew, why the hell would they know that it was about a Maharishi? You know, it, mm -hmm. you know so you took them at face value or you tried to read something into it because happiness is a warm gun. It sounds as though you're advocating murder. But, you know... It's yeah, you know, the whole story about Lucy in the sky with diamonds. It goes back to that, you know. Who, who will know? You know, we we know what certain songs are about, but some, you know, we, we may never know what what they were about, or are they just exactly what they seem, you know, on the on the surface, you know. So you know, any every Beatles album has has led to a lot of analysis, a lot of speculation. But it is interesting. You're right to say that, that to look back at, at at what people said at the time and how they received it. My favourite quote of all, and it's not it's not the White Album. It's the book before Sergeant Pepper, which, as you touched upon, is is basically the same thing, but done about 1967 and looking at that in terms of 
what happened in that year and, and that was more relevant to the music because there was psychedelia and that was one of the great things in 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 life and there was the first sort of teenage movement if you like and that undoubtedly had an impact on the music but new musical express you know one of the great music papers of this country and many others decided that the uh, clear quote was it will sell like hot cakes which means that you know in this country hot cakes are very popular so it's all you know it'll sell like hot cakes. that's all they said about it <laughs> <laughs> his argument yeah. the greatest concept record ever made and it'll sell like hot cakes yeah. like, you know uh, so, uh, you know, it, it's there for everyone to listen to and to look at and to take take a view on, you know, the White Album, you know, with, with the whole thing with the embossing and, and having, having it, I, you know. I spoke to the guy, you may have read the bit when I spoke to the guy who was a friend of mine, Roel Kreiser, who worked with me at EMI, and he was in the Bovima company, which was the uh, EMI company in Holland. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, he, and he, you know, he just said, you know, they got this piece of white paper uh, they got this double album, you know, after that, and they're going, okay, well, what, you know, what's going to be the single? Oh, back in the USSR. Oh, good. You know, they sat around and trying to work out, you know, a single. And then, of course, we were told there was no single. And, by the way, there's no photograph. The front cover is what it is. And they said, they go, well, how are we supposed to sell this thing? You know, and then, of course, they couldn't emboss. They had no they had no printing works in Holland that could emboss the Beatles onto the record cover. So they, <laughs> they, had, to send, oh, they had to send them back to England to be embossed. Uh, <laughs> but it was their expectation is how could you have a Beatles cover without a photograph on? Well, you can, you know, obviously you can, because, you know, and Pink Floyd, then, you know, I worked with them. They carried on doing this with Dark Side of the Moon and Mama Gamma. You know, where they, their pictures never appeared anywhere. So, you know, the Beatles were were big enough. You know, you go back to, I think, Rubber Soul was the first record they made which in this country, which didn't have their name on it. Right. On the mm-hmm. cover, it just had Rubber Soul and a picture of the Beatles. And you went, OK, I know who they are now. Uh, so, you know, but, the, the, the you know, the White Album, was it just an easy way out or was it a, a, a work of, you know, the, the art world will tell you it was a you know a, a wonderful concept as an alternative to the delightful colourful Sergeant Pepper you know others will go you know I want a picture of the Beatles what the hell's going on here um, so it's left to everybody's own devices and their own opinions which is the great thing about it I think but the history part of it was fun and and certainly talking to people yeah talking to people and looking back at those quotes about how it was received and 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 you know what people thought about it and you know there's a dave Hep- david hepworth who launched uh, q magazine and mojo in this country is a very very esteemed writer and lovely man you know and he remembers it because uh, with great affection because it had an it had a naughty picture on the you know the inside selection of photograph contained uh, a, a nude paul if you if one remembers mm-hmm. which is, which she loved because he upset his mum. <laughs> you know, he's seventeen or eighteen at the age. So you know, you, you know, they've all got you've all got a memory which is to do with you know either the cover or the the artwork or a particular track. Yeah, Darren. <clears throat> Excuse me. Earlier on, when we were talking about the uh, the times being reflected and the songs on on the White Album, whether or not there was any uh, influence yeah. at the times. Uh, at once the White Album came out, of course, unfortunately, you know, someone like Charles Manson actually embraced the oh, White Album and said that, that pickings, yeah, yeah. exactly the, the Beatles yeah. were sending him messages in there, which was like the reverse of what, uh, you know, the Beatles being influenced by the times. Well, here's a, a lunatic reading something absurd into these Beatles songs. Yeah. Yeah, which is which is something they had to they you know they and other people have to live with I suppose is right. you, know, you you write a song and somebody who's you know as you say a lunatic who's you know living in another world decides this will be my theme tune <laughs> and uh, right and and you have to live with it and you you know you have to endlessly spend your time saying it's nothing to do with me guys you know it was just a song um, right. but was piggies about the police you know. Was it a reference to the, the police? You know, the police were known as pigs. Was it a reference to that? You know, uh, who knows? You know, I've heard it's supposed to have been influenced by the book Animal Farm. Yes, yeah, but you know, but then the people started leading into 
you know, the police violence at the American demonstrations by students in America and the Vietnam protests and, you know, heavy handed policing and, you know, in, in France. and whatever. So, you know, were, were they all pigs? Yes. You know, it's it, people take it to different levels. You know, I mean, Julia is one that we know quite obviously is about, you know, his mum. That wasn't difficult. Um, and partly Yoko. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm should... not a psychologist. I'm not getting into that one. Yeah. <laughs> you, know, you mentioned the, that. Uh, you mentioned at the time that the album came out, you were sort of out of touch with. Yeah. You know what the Beatles were doing and po- and what was happening in popular music at the time. When did you catch up and uh, discover the White Album from beginning to end? Probably after Abbey Road. Okay. Uh, probably after Abbey Road, I got married in the year that Abbey Road came out. In fact, I got, I got married, I think, the week it came out, uh, which is why I never bought a copy of that either. I was too busy having a, having a wedding, as I recall. <laughs> My stag night was on the day it came out, uh, and I hadn't realised that at the time. Um, <laughs> so... Uh, and I'm, I'm celebrating my golden 50th wedding anniversary uh, this year. Um, oh, congratulations. So we're, we're still there. So, yes, I, when, when, when I got married and then we had our first flat together and then we had our first house together and obviously we then had our, re- our own record player. Uh, uh-huh. <laughs> and then you started catching up with, with stuff. You know, we didn't have any children for some for, for a while. And, you know, so you were able to, I was able to, you know, go to, I was in the record business, you go to gigs, you go to shows, catching up with records and picking up, you know, new stuff that was going on, you know, the, the whatever. So at that point, you could go back, you had time to go back in and go, oh, I missed that one, you know, pick up on some, some of the other things that, that, that happened at that time musically. So it was, you know, probably 70, 71. But it wasn't, you know, because it didn't have a hit single on it or, or tracks, you know, like Here Comes the Sun or, you know, or, you know, stuff that was on um, uh, Get Back or Let It Be, Long and Winding Road. You know, it didn't have anything that, that stood out in, in that respect for me. So, you, you know, it, it wasn't one you went back to. You know, if you went back to a Beatles record, you know, you might play Rubber Soul. I mean, you know, I mean, my favourite Beatles album is probably Please Please Me. Why is that? Simply because I was uh, 1963. I was 16, 17 years of age and it changed my life. You know, mm. as I did to any, you know, you talk to Chris Thomas, the producer, who's basically the same age as me. And this was a record that. You know, previously we had Elvis Presley and all your great American stars, and then we had our sort of copies of, with Cliff Richard and so on and so forth. And then all of a sudden, there's this thing that arrives, which is four blokes from Liverpool, you know, who writing, performing, singing music that is not a cover of America, or they did American covers, but they gave them their own slant. You know, the idea that four young men from Liverpool can sing songs that were recorded by four girls from America, you know, and they had no qualms about covering Shirelles and Jippons and Donays or whatever. And they took things like Twist and Shout and it was just a most exciting, it wasn't the best record technically, production wise, but the excitement, you know, the the, the, the rawness, the just, it, it changed, you know, so all of a sudden, you know, as a teenager, you had something to, to hang on to that was achievable in a way. Everybody then wanted to be a Beatle, which one did you look like? I look like George, obviously. Um, <laughs> you know, everyone, every girl that you went to school with had a favourite Beatle. And, and uh, you know, then they had, you know, can you like the Beatles and can you like the Rolling Stones? Well, yes, of course you can, but that became a, a sort of media battle that, you know, you as Stones Man or a Beatles Man. So, I, you know, it's just for me, not technically the best album they ever made. The songs on it aren't the best songs they ever wrote. But in terms of sheer excitement and the impact it had on a generation, it's just, you know, it's, it's like Elvis arriving in 1955, if you like. You know, it's that same moment. So that I, you know, I, that's one I would just always go for. You know, you, you can then talk about Rubber Soul in terms of the quality of the songs, and you know, Abbey Road is just, you know, just a wonderful send-off. Thanks, good night, boys. This is it. You know, <laughs> it's not a bad record to end on. So 
but the white album doesn't doesn't sit for me like that. It just it is it is a bit of a mismatch, you know. It was fascinating to look at it again and to write about it and 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 talk to people about it. But you know, as a finished product, it it, it left something for me personally. But that doesn't alter the fact that it meant an awful lot to an awful lot of people. It was a very successful record and has its you know yeah has its place in history. And as you said, it came out in a year that was a very very bizarre year i mean a, a worrying year if you were back then in 68 in terms of the politics and going on and 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 you know it's is are we in for anarchy and the protests the the you know the the, the race riots in america the anti-vietnam why the, the, the as i say paris was a million people went on strike students in germany were, were, were you know they were they were killed it was you know in england we we, we marched on the american embassy not not me personally but people did to protest, so there was an awful lot of, of, of disenchantment and, and disillusion, you know, being people being disillusioned with the with the politics and the people who were supposed to be running this thing. But like all things, it moved on. You know, uh, one ends the, the Sergeant Pepper book with you know, psychedelia was sort of all over by December 1967. <laughs> you know, San, it was a tourist trap in San Francisco by then. You know, Graham Nash told me, you know, he went there and it was just it was sort of like going to Blackpool, you know, it had become no longer, you know, Hippie Villa disappeared into this sort of commercial world. And that, you know, only lasted about a year, um, you know, and then, you know, 69 was, you know, a better year. Yeah. I just wanted to say that for someone like myself, when the Beatles were happening in the 60s, I was a little kid and mm. I loved all the music, all the songs. I, you know, it, it was very easy for me to fall in love with every album and every song, but I didn't have the mind where I can process this rapid progression from album to album. And so it's fascinating to me how people who lived through it, who are older in their teens or 20s or yeah. whatever, how they viewed this. Because to go from something like Sgt. Pepper and Magical Mystery Tour to the White Album, which in my opinion is the most musically eclectic album from any artist of all time. I mean, the Beatles explored so many genres of music mm -hmm. on here, and in my opinion, did them very well. To go from Helter Skelter to Honey Pie, two opposite extremes there, to throw something like Revolution Number no. 9 in there, you know, which must have blown so many people's minds. From what <laughs> you observed as a British guy, amongst your contemporaries, the people in your age group, was it a very mixed reaction? Or was it difficult to accept this? And aside from the fact that it was a double album, that's that's more to absorb there. That's more to take yeah, in. It was. It wasn't accepted as readily as um, as previous albums because, as you say, there was you know there were thirty songs. There was an extraordinary musical mix. Uh, one of the things that you know, it, it, and it was Ray Connolly's line referring to that line about the the Beatles no longer being the Fab Four. You know, this country, because they were ours and not yours, you know, that, that was always the case with us. They were, you know, they were ours, they were British, you know, and it was Mersey Beat and all that stuff. People didn't want them to grow up, and you know, and they wanted to grow up, you know, John and John, they, you know, they, they didn't want to be the mop tops anymore. They did want to be, they were grown men for God's sake. You know, I don't know what they, you know, whatever age they were by now, 28, 29, they were no, they didn't want to be, the singing love me do and stuff but the public had there's, there's a great difficulty for people particularly in this country they had a love affair with you know these four mop top boys who made great pop records uh, and it you know the white album was the was the the, the first of them you know the, the sergeant pepper they had you know they'd stopped being They'd stop touring. They'd stop doing what everyone expected them to do. You could just go and see them at the local theatre on tour. You could. They made singles. They stopped doing that stuff, and that sat uncomfortably with a lot of people. And and then this album came out, which I think I think you're probably right. Looking back on it, it is probably a better album now than it was then, because you, you know you have time to appreciate it. You, at the time, one was looking for something. That was to do with our own, our own past, our own history, our own, our own ideas of what they should be making. You know, I mean, 
by the time they'd made Rubber Soul, which was, I think, their sixth album in this country, you know, it was only three years. <laughs> you know, it was the first album was in early 63, and the sixth album was in late 65. You get, that's quite, and, and you were not, you know, when it came out, it, you sort of expected it to be as good as it was. You expected all of them to be as good as they were and better than the last one because that's what they were doing. And, you know, and Sgt. Pepper carried that on. I think the White Album, yeah, people were very, very suspicious of the whole Indian thing as well. You know, that, that, that's where, oh, they've all gone bonkers now. You know, they've all gone off to win. They're all mad. The whole Maharishi thing and all that stuff, you know, that I think there was a great deal of, of, of sort of suspicion and, and is this a publicity stunt? You know, who is this strange man with the long hair and the flowers, etc., cetera, et cetera. Mm. Uh, I don't think that did their credibility any good at all. And they were making remarks about each other. There was undoubtedly some sort of, spitefulness and disarray and you know with, with, with Yoko arriving and and that not going down particularly well so I think the album came out in at a time when there was I don't know a, de- a, a deal of perhaps uh, cynicism perhaps people were looking at them suspiciously as to what this, these guys were going to do next and they didn't they didn't follow Sergeant Pepper in the way that people wanted them to follow Sergeant Pepper I think that was you know, and then they came back with, you know, the get back, let it be thing, which was, you know, another bizarre, although, you know, the music on the, the end product wasn't wasn't half bad. And they got it back together for Abbey Road, which for me is, you know, is, is, is another great album. But I just think it, it, it was one of those things that it, it came at a difficult time for them, much of, much of their own creation, you know, but they didn't have to worry what you know, what the rest of us thought necessarily, you know, they, they were going to make, you know, John Lennon once said, you know, he didn't care what was on top of the chart. You know, the fact that Strawberry Fields was kept off the charts by a man called, you know, Engelbert Humperdinck sing, you know, um, singing Release Me uh, didn't bother him at all. You know, couldn't care less. The world at large and Beatles fans will tell you, you know, Strawberry Fields, Penny Lane, the greatest double A side ever, and it never made it to number one in this country. How you know how awful that would. And the guys would they would say, Well, who cares? You know, it was a great song, it was a great record. We had a great time making it. it we achieved everything we wanted to do with it musically. If it didn't make number one, so be it. That they weren't that bothered about those sort of commercial things. You know, I think we were, the media were, you know, and we, as commentators, will sit there and say, well, how, how can Strawberry Fields Penny Lane not be a number one in the UK? You know, <laughs> it's, mm-hmm. it's unbearable. But it was. And, you know, the last people who were concerned about it were them. You know, but they were too powerful, too important, too rich, arguably, too, uh, and were only interested in making the music they wanted to make. And that was one of the things that they earned the right to do. Well, unquestionably, whether one likes the White Album or not, the Beatles had earned the right to make it because they were who they were. They'd gone through what they'd gone through to get to this point. They, you know, the touring, the never-ending touring, the never-ending recording sessions. You know, they just went in and worked and worked and worked. And people forget, you know, how hard they worked, how many songs they wrote, how many songs they recorded, how many shows they played, how much they travelled around the world. And they'd earned the right to say, well, you know, mate, this, this is our record. You know, we want to make, we've all got songs here. We all want to put them on this record. You know, I might not want to work with George. George may not want to work with John. And George, but hey, you know, I've got these songs and you've got your songs and I've got my song. And even Ringo's got a song. Uh, so, hey, the only way we're going to do this is for a double album with 30 tracks. And if that's what it needs, so be it. That's what it needs. You know, they'd earned, the, no one at EMI was going to say to them, guys, you can't do this. You know that's absolutely right. They'd they'd earned that right to do that, and they were you know and and uh, all power to them. It, it doesn't you know it doesn't bother me. I, I you know if I don't like all of it, then that's perhaps my problem, not theirs. Mm. And to think there was almost more than thirty songs on it because there were a few <laughs> more that were left behind on the stove. There were a couple, I think. There were a couple. Yeah. There was um, oh George's thing, uh, Northern. Not uh, not guilty and um, no, it was not guilty in circles. Yeah, yeah. Circles and, uh, and, uh, of course, had what's the new Mary Jane? Well, <laughs> that, we, we've heard, yeah. we've heard, the, we've heard the demos of that. You know, yeah, you know, there comes a point when even they went, yeah, probably not. Uh, so, yeah, but you know, you, ha- you one has to remember that 
how powerful they were, even if they didn't necessarily flaunt it in, in, in lots of ways, they were incredibly powerful in terms of this is what we're going to do with the Beatles. And people like Pink Floyd and people like the Eagles and people like Bob Dylan, they learned that lesson. But I mean, I think Dylan had already learned it, you know, at that point. But these guys were not going to be trifled with. They were not going to be told what to do by a record company. They were going to do what they and they don't the right to do it. Um, they, you know, they, they were still by this time, you know, the EMI's biggest selling act around the world. You know, what are you going to do? You want to upset them? <laughs> <laughs> we'll do the double album. We'll put the white cover out and then we'll emboss it with, uh, you know, I mean, you know, McCartney agrees with me that the idea of making every copy of the white album in breath, you know, has a, has a number on the bottom for the biggest ever limited edition. You know, EMI gave up after about five million probably. If they did that many, I don't believe they did. You know, and and who was going to count? <laughs> you know, the to me, the White Album, as the decades passed, ended up becoming the measuring stick for eclectic double albums in popular music. And often, you know, being uh, you know in radio, I'll often say, "Oh, this particular album is their this band's White Album." It became, as I mentioned, like a measuring stick for. Albums that were eclectic, that were potentially all over the place, and uh, long, and, and that had no concern for commerciality. Right. I mean, they, they obviously didn't want it to be panned. They didn't want it to be not to be a success. You know, obviously in their own minds, they, you know, they liked it being successful. They liked people buying it. They liked people hearing it. Whether it was number one in twenty-five countries or number one in three countries, or you know, that, that was that sort of academic, really. But yes, it's it's unquestionably, you know, as you say, the yardstick for that sort of album, which was not having an idea about, you know, the single, the songs, the cover versions, the, the you know, the, the whole, and they weren't bothered. They made what they wanted to make and they don't that right. So you're absolutely right. In that respect, that it probably has become the yardstick for, for that sort of record and that sort of album. And very few of them that have followed will ever be as successful as the White Album. Right. I think yeah. the three that always pop into my head start with the Rolling Stones' Exile on Main Street, yeah. Fleetwood Mac's Tusk, and uh, an album by Wilco called Being There. Double albums stylistically all over the map. Yeah, that was a Warner's album, wasn't it? I think I was working with Warner's when that came out. What, Wilco? Yeah, they yeah. were... Yeah. Yeah, well, they no. were uh, yeah, they were uh, that was still when they were on reprise, so Oh okay. Well which I, is part I, of I believe so. <laughs> Warner is right. For the Warners, yeah. Oh uh, yeah, Exile and Mind Street, perfect example. You know, it was it was the, the Rolling Stones white album, if you like. Mm -hmm. You know, recorded in complete disarray. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, a fabulous record in many, many ways. I probably prefer it to the White Album, but that's another another matter. But you're right; it, it, it's that sort of record that you've reached the level, a pinnacle of uh, in your career that you can do. Well, Wilco hadn't, of course, but uh, Fleetwood Mac had had, had they already put out um, what was the big one? Um, rumors. Yeah, they'd already done rumors. Hadn't rumors. They? They'd already done rumors. Right was before Tusk. So they don't, again, they were in a position, as with the Rolling Stones, as with the Beatles, where you can go, you know, I'm going to go away and make a record. I may be a year, I may be two years, I don't know. You know, Coldplay are in that position these days as well, I think, you know, in terms of, you know, you'll get it when you get it, and it'll be what it is. And, you know, perhaps you just have to run with it, because that's what we're going to do. We, You know, I mean, Coldplay have never written, well, they've written a couple of, so I suppose, sort of like, hit pop singles in a way with yellow and stuff. But they, you know, they're a band that are going in that route. Pink Floyd, you know, I worked with Floyd for years and the idea of them ever compromising, you know, yeah. just, hey, really? Uh, <laughs> I was their press officer and they didn't do an interview in, in 10 years. You know, it's the best job in the world. Uh, <laughs> you know, they, they did nothing. We didn't even have any photographs because they didn't want to be, they didn't want to be recognised. You know, we, we had no press photos at all. We eventually had to mock up a set of four photos taken live on stage and, and sort of meld it together to make a sort of eight by six photo shot, you know, for print for, for PR purposes. But they didn't, you know, they played the wall at Earl's Court and, and sent, you know, out came four musicians in total darkness <laughs> to play the opening chords of the wall. The whole place erupts into rapture. The lights goes up. It's not Pink Floyd. 
Nope. It's four. It's four other people they've sent out. <laughs> that's, that's, their, man. that's their idea of fun, you know. And no one knows who the hell they are, you know. They they they're okay. We have some good times, and we play cricket with against Pink Floyd every year. EMI versus Pink Floyd. It was an annual event. But you try and get them to do a radio interview or press interview, or you know, or compromise on a record or a cover, and you know, no, nah, hell would freak over before you got that. But you learn to live with it. You know. You're talking talking about my second favorite band, the Pink Floyd. Okay, yeah, okay. No, they're a great band, but they're not. You know, you you, you don't want to. You know, then they don't go the route of, you know, the Beatles were far more accommodating in terms of press because of because of who they were, and they made they made pop records and they had hit singles and they had a manager that understood it all. Floyd, you know, were never going to go down that particular route, you know. Uh, so they did do interviews back in the day when they put out Arnold Lane and, and see Emily play and stuff. But they, you know, they got fewer and further apart. And as I say, I don't think in my time working with them, they, they as their press officer, they did one interview ever. But, you know, that was that was sort of the fun of it, you know. And we're going to have Dark Side of the Moon, which won't have the title on it, and it won't have the band's name on it. And you went, OK, OK. <laughs> You know, like, you can't do that. And Pink Floyd said, watch, you want to try us? You know, and their compromise was to was to shrink wrap it and put a sticker on it which said Pink Floyd Dark Side of the Moon. <laughs> but once you, take, once you take the shrink wrapping off, you've got a record with no title and no band. But today's <laughs> You know, record companies, you know, I, I you know, you said, said to artists back in the days of before you got your own browser, you know, in, in, in Tower or H&B or wherever, you got the Bob Dylan browser with all the Bob Dylan records, you got the Beatles, all the Beatles. Before you got your own browser bit and you were just in, you know, mail A to D, if you like, <laughs> every artist we ever worked with, put your name, top right-hand cover. I don't, of the corner, uh, top right-hand corner of the cover. I don't care what the picture is. I don't care what it's called. You put your name, top right-hand corner, because when you're flicking through the browser of albums, there's your name, top right-hand corner. Put the title, top left-hand corner, will help, and everyone can see what it is without having to take it out, turn it over, and look at it, because you're talking about instant recognition if you can get it. People are, oh, I'm looking for that record by what's his name? I can't remember. Oh, there it is. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, and we had some arguments with artists who didn't want to go down that particular route. <laughs> oh, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that that was just us being, you know, we, we wanted a simple way out. <laughs> and, you know, you were in a browser from, you know, mail A to, a to D. You were, you know, you were just another artist between the letters A to D. Uh, and as I say, when you became famous and got your own browser, then you can do what you like. Uh, but, yeah. Brian, a couple last questions. Um, yes, since you put out a book on Sgt. Pepper two years ago and the White Album last year, should we assume that you'll have a book on Abbey Road this year? No. <laughs> Definitely not. I will have a book out this year, and it will be about the Beatles, but it won't be a third one in this series, uh, which might have been nice. It wasn't my choice. The publishers came to me with another idea, uh, and that was the idea they wanted to run with. And I thought, oh, that's an interesting idea. And when you, when you get it, you'll hopefully see it's an interesting idea. I won't tell you what it is, because I don't think it's not been sort of announced yet. It's coming out, I think, in August. I've just, just actually finished it uh, today. Funny enough, I did the last, oh, wow. inter last interview today, which I have to send off. What's tomorrow? Friday, yes. I'll send it off tomorrow. Uh, they send me a check. I'll send them some copy. I think that's how it works. Uh, or I mm. send them the copy and they send so, me the check. I can't remember. I guess, I guess it's safe to say it's uh, there's not going to be a Yellow Submarine album book. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, you know, that's not... I, well, I mean, it, it, it does worry me that it, it, it is listed as one of the 12 official UK Beatles releases. <laughs> You know, but hey, there are speculations as to why that was because you know it gave it gave George uh, it gave George Martin a great a great royalty income. It sure did. Yeah, right, 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 right. Yeah. Uh, yes, indeed. You see, one has to remember that they talked about an EP, they talked about this set and the other, but you know the, the idea of putting out as a Beatles album with George having all the second side meant that they could perhaps reward him in some way. Because, you know, up until the day he left EMI and formed Air Studios, he didn't get a royalty. Interesting. You know, he got paid three grand, three thousand to three and a half thousand pounds a year as an EMI staff producer, making Love Me Do, Can't Buy Me Love, all those great, you know, all those great records. He got no royalty at all because he was a staff producer. And, you know, then he went off to Air Studios where he obviously had a different deal because he was now negotiating as an individual with the Beatles. But maybe the idea of putting out Yellow Submarine and letting him own some royalties from the sales because he, you know, he composed and performed the B-side was a gesture. Uh, that, that's one of the pieces of speculation as to why it was put out. 
I don't. They weren't particularly enamoured with Yellow Submarine. I'm not enamoured with it either. I don't actually like the film either. Some people <laughs> tell me it's a, somebody told me it's the greatest cartoon film since Fantasia, and I went, no, oh, okay. I, I sort of don't get it. I mean, I, I I don't hate it. I just thought, yeah, okay. A bit like them, I think they went okay. You know, they had a third album, they had a, fir- a film deal which required them to do a third film, and they weren't going to do it, so they weren't going to be in it. So, you know, the only way to get around it is a cartoon, I suppose. You know, uh, I mean, they, you know, they inherited the deal from Brian Epstein, God bless him, and they had that's part of the stuff that they had to deal with again. So, we were talking about one, uh, you know, 1968, they're you know, they're, they're, they're working through all this stuff, uh, trying to work out how they run a business, there are people trying to take over the business from them, you know, as we know that eventually Alan Klein then arrived and that whole disarray that led to the whole thing with Spectre, you know, they were, they were, you know, they were virgins in terms of businessmen. They, they made records, you know. I mean, I remember Paul McCartney telling me years ago, he had no idea how music publishing worked. Why should he? Why should he know? You know, he wrote songs. Mm. They had a, and somebody said, "We'll have a publishing company so we can publish the songs because you get, you know, you you get income as as a songwriter." You know, oh, okay, fine. Didn't realise, of course, that they it meant every time that someone else covered your song, you got money, or you indeed could sit down and write a song for somebody else, and that's and you got money for that. Why would they understand the world of music publishing? You, you, there are a whole bunch of journalists working on newspapers from the Financial Times to the Wall Street Journal who don't understand the difference between the record company and a publishing company. They think they're all music companies and they don't understand, you know, the income that comes from a publisher and the, the, the song, which is why Michael Jackson has the songs and not the records. You can apply, as you, you know, you can apply to use a Lennon McCartney song in a commercial, but you have to apply to Michael Jackson. If you want to use the Beatles version, if you've got Michael Jackson or Sony's permission to use the song, and then you want to use the Beatles version of it, you then have to go to EMI, Apple, Stroke Capital, which you'll never get permission to do so anyway. So, so then you can, if you've got permission to use the song, you can go and hire a band, a sound alike band, who will do a cover version for you to use in your commercial. You know, there's an awful lot of people who don't understand that they are two entirely different businesses. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, and McCartney said it took a long time. You know, he didn't know that you could, you got money from writing songs. You know, you got money from selling records that they understood because it was a chart. You know, you were number one and you were number, and you got money. You sold, you know, you'd sold a million records or half a million records or whatever. The idea of, of, of you know, songwriting being, uh, you know, a source of great income, being a career was, was why would they know that? You know, they, they weren't in the Brill Building or, you know, Tim Pan Alley. They were just in a band. So it took them, you know, and, and then eventually, of course, they did come up with a great line of let's write, sit down and write a swimming pool, you know, because <laughs> yeah. you know, we'll, we'll write a swimming pool this afternoon. I think I'd like a new one. You know, they, they and Paul, ultimately, of course, owns Buddy Holly and, you know, whatever else he owns as music. So he got the hang of that uh, and, you know, and persuaded Michael Jackson that he should invest heavily into music publishing, <laughs> which was a whole other story, which we can talk about another day. <laughs> <laughs> Northern Songs, which was a fascinating book to write. I loved writing that book. That was just weird. <laughs> we should have you back just to talk about that and the uh, whole music publishing end. <laughs> I think so, anyway. <laughs> we've mastered, well, now we've mastered Skype, we can be, we'll do it. <laughs> uh, as and when. I'm, I'm, a, I'm around and happy to help. And, uh, you know, I appreciate you guys taking the time out today for me. Thank you. One last question. When's the last time that you saw or spoke to Paul or Ringo? Or, or have you had any contact through the years with Yoko or Olivia? Olivia, no, I wrote to Olivia's office because I, I was asked if I could do a, 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 if I would do a George Harrison book, an authorised George Harrison book. Hmm. And I wrote to Olivia uh, and I got a note back saying no, which is fair enough. And no, I don't think that she's ever, I don't think that there is one. Is there? No one's done an authorised George book, have they? No. No, there's a few unauthorised, but... Uh, yeah, that, so the publishers wanted author. So that was the end of that one. Ringo, I haven't seen since he or I left EMI. I don't think. I mean, the last time I saw him was in 19... Uh, just to speak to him, and he was in 1975, 1975, 76, or whenever, in Manchester Square. So John, uh, John, I, I never met. Uh, Yoko, funnily enough, I, I had I, I had lunch with Yoko and uh, and her son. Uh, in London at uh, uh, an HMV 
dinner. They were guests of honour at a, at a charity event in, in London that we put on for, I can't remember what the charity was now, but anyway, it was it was to do with HMB, sponsored, organised it. Uh, and Yoko and Julian, uh, and Sean, I'm sorry, were were there. Um, and I was sat on the same table uh, next to her and, and we had conversation. We'd spoken on the phone about a couple of things before that. And she was utterly charming. Um but a bit disarming because it's, uh, she can speak and un- she understands and speaks English absolutely perfectly. But there is that sort of intrusible oriental thing where you sort of sit, she just look at you and you have no idea whether she understands what you're saying. Hmm. <laughs> you know, it's just it's 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 an art that that she has in terms of I, I, yeah. Do, do you understand me? Do you, uh, do you know what I'm talking about? Or, but she was absolutely absolutely utterly pleasant, utterly charming. That was about Paul. The last time I saw Paul, I think, was when I was at Warner's, and and he opened his old manager, Stephen Shrimpton, who was a ma- was a managing director of EMI Australia. So I knew him for many years. He then came to England to become Paul's manager in 80, 81, 82, 83, somewhere around about there. And he is, of course, the Australian character in Give My Regards to Broad Street, played by Brian Brown, I think, the actor. Who has who plays the, the sort of semi-Australian manager who was based upon Stephen Simpson, but uh, as Stephen said, he's not as good looking as me. Um, <laughs> and Stephen has, was by then at Warner's Warner Music International, where I was. And uh, Paul was because I was doing also doing some work with HMV. Paul opened the HMV shop in Oxford Street, the mega store, not the old original store, but a new store down the other one, another end of Oxford Street in London. And Paul came to open that and do a PA and whatever else. So, so Stephen and I went down to say hi because I was working with HMV and Stephen came with me to see Paul who we hadn't seen for some while. So that was the last time uh, I saw Paul, which would be somewhere in the uh, in the nineties, I think, uh, mm-hmm. mid to late nineties, I think, something like that. So no, I don't have uh, any. You know, you you move on, uh, <laughs> as they yeah. say. You you better move on. You know. Um, you know, they were great times, you know, to, to, to sit down here and say that, you know, I worked with and met three members of the greatest band that ever existed and had some great times, memorable times, some interesting arguments with, with Paul over the years, which is always good fun to have. Um, you know, sat down with him in, in Abbey Road and wrote the book. I, that, that's one of my fondest memories was, was, was going to Abbey Road to interview him for the Abbey Road book and... Uh, he said, "You know, do anywhere you 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 want to you want to go to to do this." And I said, "No, no, wherever you you know wherever you fancy, I don't I don't mind." He said, "Shall we go to my um, to my secret hideaway?" And I went, "Yeah, okay, fine." And he explained to me that each of the Beatles had a a, a secret hideaway in Abbey Road where they used to go to get away from each other and whatever else was going on. And Paul's was in the basement in the boiler room. Oh, huh. he's huge. These huge boilers. I mean, you're talking massive industrial boilers for heating, heating Abbey Road. Uh, and we sat down there on a couple of beer crates uh, and did, did the interview in there. And he, would, as I say, that's one of the reasons I think with, he stayed with EMI for so long. He had very, very fond memories of EMI. He he was very he, he loved Abbey Road. He loved the history of, of of the company. And you know, he said to me once, you know, it's the only place in the world where you can queue up for a cup of tea. You know, behind the classic, you know, Sir Malcolm Sargent, the conductor with the London Philharmonic Orchestra, and and Peter Sellers, the comedian standing. But you know, it's the only place in the world where you can all be making a record at the same time in the same studio. Um, mm. Yeah, and he he loved that. He loved that whole thing about it uh, much more so than than the others. Who to some of them it was just a place of work. You know, they came in to make a record and they went home. I don't think John had any great. Uh, affection for Abbey Road more than any other place, um, but Paul definitely had a had a had a vibe about it. You know, for him, he 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 loved it, uh, and you know, he even came along to the book book launch and stuff like that. So you know, well, Brian, it's been great having you here for the show. And once again, the name of the book is The White Album: Revolution, Politics, and Recording the Beatles and the World in 1968. And mm-hmm. uh, anytime you want to come back. You have Skype now. Yeah. <laughs> I I've now Thank moved you. into the 21st or 22nd, or whatever century we were in. My 11 year old granddaughter taught me how to do this. That's, that's a worrying thing, you say. <laughs> I write I books. Uh, I write 
on a computer and I understand vaguely and I, you know, have mobile phones, but I have not a great interest in technology at all. It doesn't, I don't have a, my wife has a tablet, but I don't have laptops. I don't have apps on my phone or something. I, I you know, I'm a Luddite in many ways and, and computer for me is just an, up, an upgraded typewriter. You know, I write on it. Uh, I'm not all that far behind you, Brian. Okay. Well, you know, <laughs> several times. Throughout, this, the, throughout the interview here, I was afraid I was disconnecting myself by, uh, what does this button do? <laughs> well, I did, you did drop out once, so you obviously pressed it. I pressed something. I don't, that must have been the dropout button, so I hope I could find it again. Okay. Well, I, you know, I've long lived the pencil. That's what I say. <laughs> I think, Brian, you have passed the audition for being a, a go-to guy for us here at Things We Said Today. <laughs> when we want to talk about publishing and all things Beatles and record companies and whatnot. So Happy, thank you so much for your time. Happy to oblige. It's been my pleasure. Take care, guys. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Darren, if people want to get in touch with you, how can they do so? Scream very loudly out the window. <laughs> um, no, uh, my email address is Darren DeVivo, uh, which is D-A-R-R-E-N-D-E-V-I-V-O, at WFUV.org. And if you go to Facebook, uh, I actually have two Facebook pages, but I prefer folks to go to the one called Darren DeVivo on WFUV Radio. Uh, so type that full name in and click like, and we'll be connected. And if you want to send me a message then uh, to say, hey, Darren, I've clicked like, uh, I'll, uh, you know, we can uh, converse that way. So those would be the two ways for me. All right. And as for myself, Ken Michaels, my email address is everylittlething at att.net. And my website is kenmichaelsradio.com. You'll find Beatles trivia there every single week where you can win one out of nine prizes and loads of interviews with people in the Beatle world. And I should mention that um, if you live in the tri-state area or especially New England, I have concert tickets to give away. This week and probably in a week or two. First of all, for the Beatles tribute band called the Fab Four, I have pairs of tickets to give away for dates for them in Connecticut and Massachusetts. And very soon I will have two pairs of tickets to give away to see the Claypool Lennon Delirium. Uh -huh. And uh, they're going to be playing in New Haven at uh, College Street Music Hall. That's uh, in April. So that's coming soon on my website. So if you live in the New England area, definitely check out my website to win tickets for those shows for uh, the Fab Four and the Claypool Lennon Delirium. Now, I don't live in the New, in New England, but I check out Ken's uh, website often. So you should, too, even if you don't live anywhere near us, <laughs> wherever that. <laughs> well, just for all the other features, there's a whole page on there with links to great articles on the Beatles group and solo, a lot of things going on in the news, articles by people that we know from our shows, you know, articles from Alan Cozy, for example, or Ken Womack or Kid O'Toole, who are part of my other podcast show, Talk More Talk. And uh, so that's it. This has been great, having Brian Soto as our guest to talk about a whole bunch of things. It went far beyond just the White Album. But uh, hopefully we'll get him back sometime in the future. And before we before we sign off and say goodbye, I thought it was funny. While while we were uh, talking to Brian, uh, while we were recording the show, I was doing some quick just checking around here and there. And I discovered about three books, non Beatle books of his that I have in my collection about other topics. And I was like, oh, wow, he wrote that. Oh, wow. <laughs> He's got a ton of books. So you know, about a variety of music topics. So he's worth, uh, he's worth exploring beyond the Beatles. Yeah. Just from the ones that he mentioned, I want to look into some of those books, yeah, especially I the, the early I... rock and rollers, the early rock and rollers mm -hmm. when they became popular, uh, in England in the early years, in the fifties and sixties, right. you know, the right. American ones. Uh, I'm, I'm very curious about that one. And the one on the Hollies. Right. You know? I have his, um, uh, record label, record companies, A to Z book. And when he said that early in the interview was when I went, wait a minute, I have an A to Z, you know, but it has been so long since I picked it up, wrote a book on the dark side of the moon. So, you know, and that's just scraping the surface anyway. So I'm sure we'll have Brian uh, back on the show at some point 
uh, in the future. Okay. Well, this has been great. Thanks so much for tuning in. And for Darren DeVivo and Brian Suttle and Alan Cozen in absentia, this is <laughs> Ken Michaels. Thank it all of you for listening, and we will see you next time. Take care. Take care.